Hello, and thank you for coming out to this year's Google I.O. conference. I'm Chris Ramsdale. I'm Kate Volkova, software engineer on App Engine team. Yes. And today, um, if you did get a chance to attend the keynote session, there was a lot of great technologies that were announced and talked about. Android had a slew of amazing technology that's coming out for both the consumer and the developer. Chrome had some great advancements. The cloud platform has some great technologies that were coming out. Um, and I'm happy to talk about, through, uh, talk about a few of those as we go through the session today. So if you did get to attend, you saw that our director of product management, Greg DiMichelli, was using uh, a demo application called WalkShare, which was an Android client that was hooked up to backend services that were running on our cloud platform, uh, namely managed VMs that were running on top of App Engine and a Redis cluster that was running on top of Compute Engine, and using the data store to store data. It allowed you to save walks and then share them with your friends and then have your friends comment on them. Well, today in this session, Zero to Hero with, with Google Cloud Platform, we're going to take a look at that application and do a deeper dive into, into how we built it using our unified tool chain, our managed platform. Kate's going to talk a bit about how we run Google production services on your laptop so you can be an efficient developer. And then finally, we'll look at some advancements we're making in the DevOps space so that you can actually debug your application in production and feel confident about what's running. So to get started, we need to start with a foundation, a Cloud Platform project. And that's super simple to do. All we need to do is bump out to our, our developer console here. We'll do create project. We'll give it a sample name, a demo name. We'll call it WalkShare 10. And we'll go ahead and create that. Now that's going to take about 10 to 15 seconds. And why that does happen, let's take a look at some of the changes that we've made in our developer console since our cloud event back in March. So the focus has been on taking the user experience and really consolidating down to the core pieces of your application. So as you can see on the left-hand side, um, we have APIs and auth, right? So that your application connect back to Google Cloud services and other Google services, as well as third-party applications connecting back into your application as well, via the endpoints that you might surface through cloud endpoints or any RESTful style. We have monitoring, right? So a consolidated view into the metrics that are coming from your application, the performance of that application, as well as centralized logging coming from Compute Engine and App Engine, which I'll touch on throughout the talk. Source code for storing your source code in the cloud, as well as doing your builds in the cloud. Compute, a consolidated home for both App Engine and Compute Engine. And finally, storage for all things storage related, whether it be non-relational, relational, or blob data. And then big data for our uh, analytics tools, such as BigQuery and Cloud Dataflow that we announced today. So now we'll see that our Application has been successfully um, built, so right, simple enough. Well, actually, through that process, within that 10 to 15 seconds, we've created quite a bit of infrastructure for you and on your behalf, right? We've created um, namespaces so that your application can connect back to our multi-tenant services, our cloud services, be it memcache, data store for storing NoSQL type data, task queues for communicating within your application. We've created those namespaces for you so you can securely hook into those services. We've given you a centralized logs repository so you can funnel all of your data from your compute back to one spot where you can view it and interact with it via the logs API or through our developer console. We've given you a Git repository so you can actually store all of your source code into the cloud, enable things like cloud debugger like you saw today from Greg. And then we also give you um, agents that are running on top of these VMs that are hooking back into all of our monitoring data. So they're monitoring the applications that are running, they're monitoring your compute, and they're funneling all of that data back into um, back into the, the dashboards that we have. OK, great. So now that we've got this up and running, we've got our project created, let's actually add some source code to it. Right? And we're going to do that with our, cloud, our Google Cloud SDK. It's our unified tool chain that brings together all the services within cloud, right? be it App Engine, Compute Engine, Cloud Storage, Cloud Data Store, pulls it all into one unified tool chain so you have those services available at your fingertips. So to see that, if we bump out to our terminal here, right? I have some local source. and what I want to do is I want to take that local source and push it into the cloud and then actually have it built and be deployed and we can check out our application running. So this is pretty straightforward. I'm going to use our G Cloud application, our Google Cloud SDK. And since I'm terrible about remembering command line options, command line parameters, I'm happy that they actually have code completion and command completion built into the SDK. So if I just do a double tap, I'll get the commands that I can run. You know, sometimes in life it's just the little things that actually make your life much, much better. So I do a G Cloud init, and we'll use that same application that we, same project that we just built. All right, and that's going to go through, and it's going to create some local directories for me and initialize some metadata about the Git repository. All right, let's clear that for easy use. 
Now what we'll do is we'll navigate into that directory and we'll copy in our source. Okay, so we got a Java application represented by a palm.xml file and some source. What we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and git add that. And commit. Let's see, initial commit for the comment. All right, all looks good. And then finally, if we just do a git push, it'll push that up into our repo. Okay, there we go. So it's taking my local source and pushing it into the cloud. And the idea there is that we want you to be a, a productive developer and allow you to use the tools that you're used to, right? In this case, Git, right? To develop locally and then finally run. And I mean run, I mean in Google production data centers. So as this Git push is going from source into the, into the cloud, into that Git repository, we're gonna see that there's services that are picking it up and actually building it. So let's funnel back over to our developer console. And if we go to our project, we do a refresh on the Git repository. Okay, so we see my source code now up in the cloud. And you see my last comment, which was just initial commit. And then since this is a Java application, we need to build it somewhere. And what we'll see is if we click down into the releases section here, we should see a build that has been kicked off. Give it just a second. Okay, there we go. And actually, by this time, it's actually build, tested, and deployed. So where is that actually building, right? So we saw that we have a Git repository in the cloud. I pushed everything up there. Something had to kick in. Well, what we're doing is, um, on your behalf, we're spinning up a Compute Engine virtual machine that's running Jenkins, so doing continuous integration for you. It's picking up that push, because there's hooks into it. It's building it on the VM. It's running my tests. And if all my tests pass, it actually does a deploy out to App Engine. And we can see that right here. And if we drill in, we can see the build logs and the diff and everything like that. So if everything is working correctly, we should have a new version up and running. And if I go to walkshare10.appspot.com, voila. So there's our application running. If I click here, So we'll post a silly comment. Good, everything is saved. All right, so now we've pushed everything into the cloud and it's running. Now, let's say that we actually, once this is running at scale, let's say that we want to do some sentiment analysis or something on this application, right? So I've got you know, hundreds, of, of com hundreds of thousands of comments that are running in that are being stored, and I want to take and do some sentiment analysis on those comments that are coming in. Now, to do that, I know that I'm going to need a bigger, beefier machine. I'll need new, more CPU and more memory, right? And furthermore, I'll need some kind of library that allow me to do uh, analysis on the streams that are coming in, uh, something like OpenCL, which is a fantastic library for doing this. Now, the problem is that historically, App Engine hasn't supported this, right? For security and scalability reasons, you're not able to run native code, so C or C++ code, or access things like the file system or the network stack. It also doesn't have the, the memory configurations and the CPU configurations, the, the, the footprints that I need to run sentiment analysis. At the same time, though, I don't want to jump all the way over into unmanaged infrastructure as a service and run all of those VMs myself. So lucky for me that back in March of this year, um, at our Cloud Platform Live event, we launched into limited preview a new feature called Managed VMs which takes the management platform capabilities of App Engine and merges those with the power of the control and the flexibility of Compute Engine, thus providing you the best of both worlds. And in, in, in the spirit of making developers highly efficient, we've made this super simple for you to get up and running to move from App Engine into, um, into managed VMs. All you have to do is can change, change your configuration file. So here we're looking at a Java configuration file. You set the VM property to true, easy enough. You specify which machine type you would want. In this case, we want an N1 standard, but actually this is a little typo in this deck. I would actually want a high CPU uh, machine here. But the nice thing is that this, with this property, you can specify any compute engine machine type, both that we have now and the ones that we're investing in in the days in the future and in the months to come. And then we need to specify the number of instances that we want. In this case, I just say that I want five. 
you can put whatever you want to in here. And furthermore, you can programmatically change the number of instances when you're running in production. And then in the coming months, we'll have auto scaling that will apply to this as well. So we'll really build out the, the complete offering. At that point in time, you'd be running in production, and you have access to those native resources that I talked about, right? You'd have that flexibility of compute engine, so you could get at the lower level network stack or the file system. You could run the OpenCL or any or C or C++ binary that you wanted to run, right? Um, and and you'd, you'd be able to do the sentiment analysis that we were looking at. Now, furthermore, it's not just about being able to run these native libraries and have access to the network stack. This also brings to, brings, to, um, brings to the front a new hosting environment where we can build new runtimes, both internal to Google and external, right? So we won't be constrained to just having Java and Python and PHP, right? You could look at having Scala or Haskell or Node. And to prove this out, we've been working with internal teams, both the Go team and the Dart team, that are both down in the cl cloud sandbox or down in the sandbox today as we speak. We've worked with them over the months to, to build this out and to actually have them uh, vet out this new hosting environment where they could run these runtimes. And we're looking to partner with other people within the community uh, and other open source providers to make this happen. And so at the end of it, once you've made your configuration changes, all you need to do is save your file, do another git commit, do another git push, and you're running into production. And when you do that push, what's nice, and what, what, is, what is, you know, in the spirit of making developers highly productive, is that that actual push, those like, I think it was one, two, three, four, five lines of configuration, get pushed out, right, and you have um, managed VMs running in production. And what that means is that we give you the hosting environment, so compute engine VMs, we make sure that they're healthy, and we make sure that they put health checking on them and healing. We make sure that we give you a web server, because after all, you're serving web traffic. We give you an application server to, to run your application. We give you a Java runtime environment to run Java, um, and then we run all your third-party code as well. Then we take and install a load balancer and wire it all up and hook it into your web servers, and we configure that all for you on your behalf. You don't have to specify any of that. And furthermore, when, in this model, what you do is you get us providing operating system updates and security patches for that hosting environment, similar to how we do on App Engine today. Right? We do co-location and locality optimizations. What that means is that we take all the pieces of your application and make sure that they're running together in a very highly available way so that we're minimizing network latency and latency within your application and giving you very, very high SLAs. And then finally, you get Google as your SRE. Now, what does that last point mean? That's a great question. At Google, there's a set of software engineers that are tasked with making sure that um, services like Search and Gmail and Geo are they're ensuring that they have high uptime and they're running in a very efficient manner. Um, and what they do is with, with those SREs, with managed VMs, you're getting the same, um, they're watching over your, your production deployments in the same manner that they're watching over search and then applying the same monitoring that they have for App Engine for years and years and years. So what that means for you as a developer is you focus on your code and what you want to build. And when you, put it, when you deploy it into Google production, the SREs are watching over that, the SREs and a lot of our services to ensure that you have high uptime and performance. So if there's something like you know, network degradation in a data center, you don't want to worry about that. We get that covered, right? If there's some link between two data centers that has like degraded, degraded performance, you don't need to worry about that either, right? If there's some external event that are actually impacting the running of your applications, we've got that covered as well. We've got monitoring services built into the data centers that funnel back into our SREs and into our, into our graphs and our dashboards to make sure that everything is running performantly for you. Now, and with managed VMs, one other point is we're running all of that inside of containers on top of Compute Engine. And we happen to be using Docker as a technology. Now, why are we using Docker? It's pretty cool, right? Who's heard of Docker in the crowd today? Yeah, that's what I thought. So it's a great technology, and it does a lot of amazing things. Um, but more specifically, what it does is it's a tool chain that gives us static binaries that our services can scale up and scale down. It's like a template that you can just go punch out new ones, right? Give me one more of these, give me one more of these, give me one more of these. And since it's static, we don't have to do any initialization when we spin it up. It's very good for scaling. Finally, it provides, or also it provides portability. So that which, which you're building on your local environment, right, we can easily run in production, and it just moves with you. And finally, it provides a container host environment that allows us to manage the host environment, providing those OS updates and security patches that I had talked about before, without impacting that which is running inside the container, concretely your application. And for more about uh, how we're using containers within Google, 
Um, be sure to check out these two sessions on containers in, in, uh, in Google Cloud as in containers in App Engine over the course of today and tomorrow. Okay, so just to check in, we've gone through quite a bit here in a matter of about 15, 20 minutes. Um, we've clearly moved away from the zero stage and closer to the hero stage, right? We've gone through getting started and getting something up and running. We've gone through getting some code, hooking that code up to our Git repository in the cloud. We've pushed, we've seen it build, and we've deployed out to production, right? We've utilized a new feature set within managed VMs, all right? And I def so I definitely think we're making a fair amount of progress here. Um, but I did mention that we are going to talk about some code, and uh, Kate's going to dive into how we're doing production Google services on your laptop. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kate. <laughs> Clap for Kate, 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 Kate. So here on my laptop, I've already got the code for our Walkshare demo. And you've seen the diagram of the project already, maybe even more than once today, so I'm not showing it again. But just as a quick reminder, we've got an Android mobile application, and then we've got the whole bunch of modules running on App Engine servers or on Compute Engine instances that process comments or display any other stats for us. So let's see uh, what we are going to concentrate on today, which is App Engine modules and, in particular, your workflow when developing on our platform. So you see here, I've got three modules. One is a web front end written in Python and JavaScript. This. And the second one is the comment server written in Java that runs on managed VMs. And the third module is a server talking to the walk route storage written in Go. So to allow you to iterate more quickly when developing on our platform, uh, our SDK provides a set of tools to emulate App Engine production environment locally on your machine. And as all the other Google Cloud Platform command line tools, it is now bundled uh, under Cloud SDK and available under gcloud command. So let's try to run that command. So here, what I pass to it is just the uh, output level that I want to see, then app preview saying that we're in preview right now, then app that's saying that it's app engine component, run the command that I actually want to do, and then the, uh, the list of modules and the dispatch that uh, uh, tells app engine uh, which uh, module, uh, which request to, to route to which module. And while this, well, it's actually already started, but I thought it could take a couple of minutes, so uh, here is the diagram to explain what was going to happen. So uh, when you run gcloud command, app run command, we start the development server for you locally on your machine. And um, that development server is just a web server that simulates running an App Engine production environment locally on your machine. And by simulating here, I mean first is enforcing some sandbox restrictions that you would have running App Engine application in production, like um, no restricted access to the file system. Or, and, but, but in second, but more, uh, that seems more important to me, is emulating all of our services, again, locally on your machine, like data store or memcache. And on top of that, you also get an admin console, the local implementation of admin console that, again, helps you debugging the app. So nothing really new yet. But if you remember, one of our modules is a, managed, is a module running on managed VMs and has this magic VM equals true setting in app engine configuration file, app engine web.xml. So how we're going to emulate that, I mean, starting and restarting several virtual machines, one per instance, on your laptop would significantly slow things down, if not completely kill it. So here, the technology that is gaining more and more momentum lately called containers comes to the rescue. And we use Docker containers to provide you with a local experience when developing for managed VMs. So when you have VM equals true in your App Engine configuration file, De development server will 
trigger the Docker build command and build the image with your code or your binaries, and then it will run that command and uh, start the container for you and start routing requests from a development server to your container and to your code, to your app running inside of that container. And to make this team work on all the platforms that we support, be that Linux, Mac, or Windows, we still have a virtual machine with that Docker daemon pre-configured and running on it, but just one. So let's flip, now that we know what's, gonna, what's supposed to be happening, let's flip back to the logs and quickly go over what I've just talked through. So first we see starting API server, so we'll get our local mem, uh, data store and memcache implementation. Then we're starting a dispatcher mo module and all the other modules. And here we are connecting to the Docker daemon and starting the managed VM module. So we are building the image, we're tagging it as application ID, uh, module name, and the version. Then we build that image, we create the container from that image, and we start running it. We also set the start signal to that uh, uh, instance exactly the same way as it works in production. And this time it even returned to 100, which is cool. So one more thing to note here that we'll get to a little bit later is this line that we can also debug, attach the debugger to our container and, and do some debugging. So one more thing to see here is the docker ps command that just lists all the containers running on my machine. And so I have this container running for three minutes. That's about time I've been talking. And we can even get some logs from that container, seeing that we are started the, uh, the instance in debug mode and forwarded the logs somewhere. Again, so now we have everything up and running. So let's see how it looks like. Hmm. Pretty similar to what Chris just shown in production, even though it's locally on my machine. Now, and Again, what I was talking about is the local version of admin console that lists all our modules. We can like click on these instances. This is just the testing servlet say, uh, printing out the Java version of the comments module. So we have the standard Java 7. And then we can do some more stuff here. We can see the, in the indices, for example. We can change something in the data store like, hmm, Unknown, maybe after this talk, I will be better known. So let's update this one. And so sometimes things like, like little things like that help us with debugging when we develop the application locally. So let's try to post the comment now. Hmm. Hmm. Something is definitely wrong. Chris, I told you not to touch my code before the demo. I sent you a code review. OK. So, <laughs> well, well. Uh, so, I mean, in normal life, I would probably, uh, if something like that happens in production, I would, the first thing I would do is probably go check the data store if the data is corrupted. But again, Chris asked me, to show you how easy the local debugging uh, of your app engine module running inside of the Docker container can be. So let's try to do that. So here I have the Android Studio and my project uh, open in here. So, and because part of that application is Android, so we're just using the same tool for developing all of the modules. So, uh, and here, Let's try to attach the debugger for, to our uh, container. So if you can see that log, we attach to the container right now. And let's try to post another comment. Well, that will be boring comment, because it probably won't work again. 
Okay, so we've got some stack trace, we've got something. Let's just follow through the, meta, the methods and see what's, what we're trying to add. Okay, we're doing some checks, we're extracting the, uh, the parameters of the request. Okay. Uh huh. This line says me something. I guess he wants it to rename the, the methods and, and uh, the, the properties and didn't rename all of them. Oh well. Let's just deattach again, fix it back, and rebuild the project and try the post, to post the comment again. So let's see if it still compiles now that I touched it. Okay, success. Good. So, and while we are uh, restarting that module, let's also do what I was talking about is actually looking into data store and see our property with the, our uh, entry with the wrong property. And let's just click delete and like it never happened. So back to the console. Uh, the cool thing about a development server is that it watches for the file changes or for, like in this case, uh, Java class changes. And uh, we uh, noticed that the that something changed and we just stop, send the stop signal to all the instances that we had and then send rebuilt the new image and created the new container from it and uh, started forward to forward requests again. And apparently that didn't quite work. Let's just, just rebuild once again. So your VM's up, but it's not restarting the instances inside of it? Uh, yep, the image got rebuilt, but it does not re want to restart the instance right now. I think my bug was more systemic than you thought. Uh, yeah, I, th I, I thought it's so like unimportant. And let me just quickly go over it again. Let me just try to restart everything. Well, better be doing locally than in production, right? Oh, well, <laughs> you need to have a backup plan sometimes. It's the demo demons. Completely done. You try one more time? Yeah, uh, yep. So while she debugs that and <clears throat> gives it one more shot, um, I think one of the interesting things here is that when you think about uh, container technologies like Docker, one of the things that they promote, much like I said, was the ability to port your application back and forth. Well, it's interesting is if you use cloud-based services, right, so hosted services, be it our services, Amazon services, whatever they may be, if there's no local story for that, the portability kind of starts to break down, right? 
Like if we didn't have, so if we just had data store in the cloud and that was it, right? Then when you say, well, it's great, I can port my application from my local environment to my production environment. The fact of the matter is that like in your local environment, if you don't have data store or task queues or memcache, you can't actually build there because you can only get half the story, right? So by taking this and making these, these production services available on your laptop or wherever you're doing development, really, um, it, it completes the story. So you really do have portability. And it's kind of crazy because even in the, the data store side of things, um, I'll never forget about a year ago. Yeah, I, I guess that I, 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 <laughs> I guess that, that will happen right in front of the uh, right during the demo. I need to clean up some space on my disk. That's terrible. <laughs> While I'm doing that, you can keep talking. Oh, okay, okay. And I'm still here. <laughs> you just, just bat me away when, I'm, when, you're, when you're ready. Uh, the, so the, the anecdote here was that uh, about a year ago, uh, I worked closely with the data store team as well. And uh, I'll never forget the, the tech lead, Alfred Fuller, came to me and he's like, he's like so we're going to put eventual consistency. Hold on, does everybody know what an eventual consistency is? No? OK, so it's the idea that when you run horizontally scalable services that sometimes uh, to get that scale, the data might not be consistent. So you might do a write, and then if you come to another data center, right, it might have not have replicated yet. And, and that gives you scale, but you have to build your applications around that. Because if you, if you expect consistency, you expect I do a write, and then I do a read immediately. And if that's not the case, then weird things happen in your application. It's, it's a, I still think it's a pretty complex um, concept to grasp. And so do some of our customers, because what they were doing is they were building in, in, our, in our local environment, like Kate's trying to demo here, um, they did, we didn't have that. It was strongly consistent, because after all, it's on your laptop. There's no replication to other data centers, right? And this kept uh, impacting customers when they moved into the cloud. So that porting from local to in production was causing um, discrepancies. And so Alfred comes and says, I'm going to build eventual consistency into our SDK. And I was like, you are out of your mind. He's like, no, 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 we're totally going to do it. And like within two, in two weeks, they had basically mimicked down to that level. Anyways. I think. <laughs> I think we really added a little bit of excitement into our demo and proving that it's all real and happening right now locally on my machine. It was not planned. I, I, I got quite a sweat. <laughs> OK, so we can develop locally, debug locally. So let's try something a bit cooler now. As you know, uh, using managed VMs together with App Engine allows you any level of customization that you want. And you can run any third-party libraries or call any binaries, which was not quite allowed with a classic app engine. So let's try something here. So for those of you who likes the functional style of Java 8 as much as I do, let's try to insert like a lambda here. Search for cool stuff. And just remove that old iteration. Don't break anything again. OK. So now we've got some Java 8 kind of style code in here. Here, Chris was supposed to ask me that but App Engine only supports Java 7. So, and my answer to this would be, let's add a little bit of customization to here. <laughs> so this is in the same vein of uh, saying that um, how we're enabling Go and Dart and how we can en enable Node and Scala and Haskell. Kate's just doing this in terms of App Engine, or in terms of Java. So going from Java 7 to Java 8 is, in, is, a, is a pretty big move, but with a few lines of configuration, she now has the, the semantics and language aspects of, of Java 8 inside of her application. Yeah, a bit more in two lines. So, and what I did here is just add a little bit more customization and to use, instead of our App Engine-based Docker image, the Docker image that I've just built before the demo. Oh, no, again, no space on the device. Oh. 
Okay, and hope hopefully that now it will be there will be enough cell It's terrible. So I was just trying to remove some containers, but let's uh, remove some images. Hopefully that none of them are important. So you know when somebody says they're demoing things that are hot off the press? I think I'd say this is hot off the press. We're, uh, we, have, we have early dog fooders that are trying this out right now, so I think it takes a lot of uh, courage <laughs> to get on stage and try it out. Should we call this one? Yeah, try, um, could you, <laughs> yeah, I'll try to fix it and show the, 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 the rest, Perfect. but while you keep I'll, I'll talking, keep talking a bit more. Fantastic. Cool. So um, yeah, minus the demo, the demo demons, I, I thought actually that was some, some really cool technology of taking um, Google production services, moving them to a laptop, and then taking technologies like Docker to enable them so you can be highly efficient um, as a developer. And what hopefully we'll show is how we can take that technology and allow you to further expand the languages and runtimes that you're using in our platform as a service offering App Engine. Uh, and then furthermore, like bringing it all down into one centralized IDE. So you, know, you notice Kate that's actually doing, if she had been doing Android development, she'd do it right there inside Android Studio, right? So you can build your mobile client and build your backend services all within one centralized tool. And you know, mobile and cloud working together is something we're extremely passionate about, and it's near and dear to our heart. So um, definitely want to check out these sessions if you're interested over the course of today and tomorrow. And by the way, don't worry. These are all in your schedule, but they'll also be put up when, I'm, uh, when we get done through with this session. Um, so I want to talk a bit about integrated DevOps. Um, so you know, when you actually move from your laptop into production, you do that deployment, your DevOps don't need to leave you. They shouldn't leave you, actually. In fact, one would say that it's even more important to have that introspection into applications that are actually running in production. Because after all, it's no longer, you know, a bug that's impacting you and your other developers that are building out the application. You're talking about bugs that actually impact your end users. And it's sometimes your business. So like in the case of search, you had another 100 milliseconds of, of latency, and it could cost you millions of dollars in terms of revenue. So with that, let's take a look at how we're doing things uh, within the Google Cloud platform in terms of DevOps. Whoops. Sorry about that. So I'm going to bump back down to the console here. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take a look at our, yeah, looking for monitoring data. Sorry about that. So first of all, what we have is um, integrated monitoring and metrics for, for your managed VMs and for your compute. And since we're bringing together App Engine and Compute Engine, we're also bringing together the data and the monitoring that you actually need to see as well. So here I'm looking at one instance, and I can see a summary of overall traffic, and I can easily bump back and forth between the actual underlying VMs. So here I'm seeing compute statistics like CPU utilization and memory utilization. But I can also see a summary of like the requests and the response latency. So those are things that you would get out of your app heuristics, right? When you're just running a raw VM, all you really see is disk, network, CPU, and, and memory. But when you're running a full-on stack, the full-on stack that I had mentioned, when you move a managed VM into, into production, you get that web server, that application server, that kind of that, that, that web serving stack that you want to see and have introspection into. And so we're doing that. Now, with managed VMs, what we're doing is we're moving, um, we're, we're moving and creating a homogenous fleet of compute for you, right? And that homogenous fleet of compute is managed by our services and by our SREs, as I kind of mentioned going through here. 
Um, now, for those services and those teams to do that, that, that fleet of compute needs to be hermetically sealed. Meaning, like, we can't just let, we don't allow developers to willy-nilly go into the machines and create what we call kind of special snowflakes. Because if you have, for example, you know, 100 VMs running, and VM 45 and 46 are slightly different than the rest, and you go try to manage all those together, it becomes highly, highly complicated. And you can imagine as you scale up to tens of thousands, it gets even worse. Now, given that, that those are locked down and you don't have root access into those, those VMs, one might say, like, well, hmm, that kind of poses a, a non-trivial problem of how do I get data off of those VMs, right? Like, for request, like logs. So how do I get you know, request logs or application logs or system logs or even third-party logs off those VMs? Well, the VMs are on the, uh, the, the logs are on the VMs, and the VMs are funneling all of that traffic and all those log data back to a centralized logging repository that I had mentioned in one of the earlier slides. And what that means for you is, as a developer, you come back to our, our console here, and you'll see that we have integrated logs access, all right? So it'll allow you to do things like uh, filter logs by, um, by log source, by log request type. You can filter by errors in a second. Um, you, can, you can actually do debugging of the, um, the request logs in terms of the, the application logging in terms of the request. You can see what the application's doing based on what the, the user is, is requesting. And finally, you can see those third-party logs as well. So let's say if we bump into... Hmm, let me actually pick a different one here. There we go. Sorry, this is a little bit delayed. So here what we can see is we see the app, the, the app engine logs. And if I filter through these, I can probably find one that's info. Yeah. If I click on the info one, right. So here what I'm seeing is that this is a request back to the, um, that's not necessarily that interesting. Well, you can see that's a request back to the underscore AH uh, remote API path, right, that's the request that came in. And what you see highlighted in the yellow there is actually what the application was, was logging. Um, I could actually sort by status 500. Do you see any errors? Oh, look at that. I actually have no bugs in my code over here. <laughs> and then if I come down to Compute Engine, you know, I mentioned that a uh, portion of the Walkshare demo was actually running a Redis cluster that allowed you to do streaming um, with some indexing in there. And so that what we're doing is actually running, I can show you the Redis logs here. So I pull that off and filter by something as simple as Redis. Yeah, okay. So there you can see all the Redis logs. The idea is we've consolidated down, down into one unified logs viewer and we're pulling those, those logs off of the, off the machines. Then finally, uh, in the topic of, so, so as I mentioned that these, these VMs are, are locked down by default, no root access is available, we realize that there's times when you need to get to the underlying VM, right? You might have a CPU spike, you might have an out of memory error, who knows, right? And, and after many years of being a developer and building developer tools, I know there's one thing that you do is that you have to know when to get out of the way of the developer and let them do what they need to do. So in the spirit of that, we've made it super easy to get to the underlying VM to break glass and get to the compute engine VM. So if I come into, I think I had this lined up over here. If I come into our versions, there we go. So here we have a managed VM that's running. We'll click on that. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at, again at the monitoring and metrics for this particular um, managed VM, which I'm only running one of. I could be five or 10, depending on how I change my properties. But what you'll see over here is this SSH tab. And I'll come back to what's in this uh, dialog, but I'm gonna work through this dialog and it's gonna open up um, root access and SSH connectivity back into the VM. And furthermore, the cloud developer, the developer console makes it super easy because we now support SSH in a tab in your browser. And what you see here is that we're, obviously we're enabling root access, but we're starting the SSH uh, service and we're, we're, enabling, uh, we're enabling access. And so now what I'm in, I'm actually in the VM. I mean, oh, I really apologize for how small this is. Wait, right, bear with me. Sorry, it's super small. But um, I'm actually in the VM, and I can do simple things like run netstat. I can run ps. I can run top if I want to. Right? All the commands that are available to you in a VM. And finally, I can exit, and I'm good to go. 
And all I need to do to get that thing back into being managed is switch from user managed to Google managed. Now, real quickly, what does that do? So when we switch it from Google managed to user managed and we enable root access, we're giving you access to the VM, in which, you can, in which case you can SSH in and make any changes you want to, right? After all, it's your VM. But by giving you root access and letting you make changes, then what we, we want to remove our management processes because it will conflict with each other. They could, right? You can make all kinds of kernel changes, who knows what. So we move it out of that pool. And furthermore, we take it out of the health checking pool as well. Because the last thing we want to have happen is our health checker, right, to a health checking service to think that the VM is actually unhealthy because you're debugging it or something and shoot it, you know, and terminate it, in which case that's a terrible developer experience for you. So we make it super simple. You move back and forth between user managed and uh, Google managed. So great. And if you want to see more on DevOps um, and how we're mo working on monitoring and our work with Stackdriver, check out these sessions today and tomorrow. Okay, so to recap, I, think, I definitely think that we've gone from the, the zero to the, we're now to the hero stage, right? We've gone through getting started, creating an application in our, in our uh, cloud platform. We've uh, deployed some code. We've done a build in the cloud, right? We've walked through how to build an Android client. We've talked about how to do integrated DevOps and centralized logging and monitoring and get access to the underlying VM and to see the, all the, the metrics and the monitoring that's coming from, our, um, coming from our VMs. So yeah, I definitely think we've reached the hero stage. There's some bumps along the way, but we got there. Um, and I see that we're kind of short on time, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Did you? Unless we can, unless we can, we want to talk through the development, uh, through the deployment step for our managed VMs. I think we're kind of. I think we're kind of out of time. Done. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so just a real quick recap. Um, developer, if it wasn't clear, developer productivity is near and dear to our hearts. It's something we're very, very passionate about, right? And the way we, we view that is like making getting started super easy to do, so that you know you get progress in the quarter, in the order of minutes, and not necessarily hours. Right? We believe in a unified tool chain, so that you have access to all of our services at your fingertips, and they're easy to use. Uh, we want to move Google production services and make them available on your laptop so it's easy to debug and to iterate and be agile. And then finally, we want inter uh, integrated DevOps to follow you into the cloud, right? So that production is no longer a black box and you can have the monitoring and introspection you need so that you can make change and actually impact your application. So again, thanks for spending time with us today. We appreciate it. And if you're interested, there's going to be some other sessions talking about some of the things we covered today uh, in our Zero to Hero talk. So thanks a lot. Thank you.